All right, this is 16.1 and 16.2 on evolution. This will be the first video on evolution. All right, so go ahead and you might want to stop the video here, but go ahead and read this question and see if you can answer it. At the end of this video, you should be able to uh, answer, this, answer this question. Same thing with this one. And the same thing with this one. Now on question number three here, either answer could be correct. It just depends on the explanation you give. Okay. So what was Charles Darwin's contribution to science? Well, he is the one that came up with, or he developed the scientific theory of biological evolution and he also explains how that occurs over time through the process of natural selection. So exactly what is evolution? You should be able to answer that in about three words and all it is or what it is is change over time. Change over time. Okay. That's the very basic definition for evolution. This right here is a map showing uh, Darwin's journey. He started here in England and you could follow the arrows and see that he went down below South America past the Galapagos Islands and he came over here okay, and then he continued his voyage this way around Cape Town and then back up to England. Do you remember how long that voyage was. So on his voyage he noticed three patterns of biodiversity and they were that species vary globally, they vary locally, and that they will vary over time. Now as far as species varying globally, all that means is that um, you might have ecologically similar species even though they live in different parts of the world. But it does not necessarily mean that they have a common ancestor. So here you have a, uh, looks like an ostrich and a rhea. And then the os and those were in, uh, ostriches were in Africa, rheas were in South America, and then emus were in Australia. Now other, uh, another way that they can vary globally is that um, if you have grasslands in Africa, say, and grasslands in the United States, you're going to have totally different animals. Totally different animals. And you can have animals that that's the only place they're found, such as the kangaroo are only found in Australia. Now, as far as them uh, varying locally, he found two species living in South America. One lived in the grasslands and the other one lived in the scrublands. So you remember they had the larger uh, rhea and then you had the smaller, lower rhea. Another way that he noticed that uh, species varied locally was with the tortoises. Uh, on Isabella Island, they had the shorter necks and a dome-shaped shell. Uh, there, the vegetation was close to the ground. However, on Hood Island, which was in the same little area of islands, they had long necks. And this is because the vegetation was up higher and uh, that allowed them to reach the high, higher vegetation. Also, there were three species of finches on the island. This was on Galapagos. And they had different beaks. Uh, and this was an advantage because it allowed them to eat different types of seeds so there wouldn't be necessarily indirect competition with each other. Now, as far as species varying over time, this uh, evidence came from fossils. And he noticed that uh, some of the fossils that he found were very similar to animals that were living uh, at this uh, today or in his time. Here's the definition of a fossil. It's the preserved remains or traces of an ancient organism. So it could, it may be a fossil of the organism or it could even be a fossil of their footprint. So he spent years actively researching and filling his notebooks with ideas about species and evolution. And there was other evidence that suggested that the species did change 
and it had to be some type of natural process. Now there were some other scientists that uh, contributed to the way that Darwin thought, and these were geologists and sociologists uh, of the time, and some of the information he found out from them or from their research helped to shape his uh, ideas. So the first scientist uh, that he uh, used some of their information was Hutton and Lyell. These guys were geologists, all right, and they're famous for saying that they were one of the first to say that the Earth is extremely old. At the time, they thought the Earth might be thousands of years old, but in fact, it was millions of years old. And the processes that um, were operating in the present were the same ones that probably shaped the Earth millions of years ago. What processes am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, erosion, you know, that comes from the weather, those type of processes. Uh, Hutton was known for the term deep time. Deep time. And this is basically that the Earth is really, really old. He's um, also was uh, instrumental in talking about the forces beneath the Earth's surface pushed up and formed the mountain ranges, and that the mountains, uh, as I said earlier, as far as erosion, can be worn down by rain, wind, heat, and cold, and it continues to happen uh, in Darwin's time and in our time. Lyell, on the other hand, is known for uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism. And Basically, what he said was the processes that we see today have to be the same ones that shaped the Earth millions of years ago. So, example, uh, volcanoes release lava and gases, and they still do today. Rivers uh, dig channels and carve canyons just as they do today. So, if you remember from the video, Darwin uh, witnessed an earthquake. Oh, not witnessed an earthquake. Do you remember when uh, he talked about finding the shells on the mountains? Well, the only way that those shells could be on the mountains is if those mountains had once been under the sea. And if there was an earthquake, or earthquakes occurred many times, this could possibly have pushed up that land and formed the mountains. He also talked about the coral. Um, you know, coral has to be close to the light. So it's either, you know, right under, under the surface of the water. And he found some coral reefs that were very, very, very deep. And if they were very, very deep, that means that the land must have shifted down. Okay. Now there's another scientist named Lamarck. Lamarck uh, had a proposal of how species evolved. And one of the things he said was that organisms could change their body parts during their lifetimes. And when I say change their body parts, I mean, so for instance, if you use your arms a lot, you can make them stronger, you can make them bigger, you even can make them longer. And say a bird did not use their wings, their wings would become smaller. And this might be partially true, but um, I don't know, um, but I don't think that it's true to the extreme that Lamarck thought it was true. The other part of Lamarck's theories were that if you did change your structure, your body parts, you could pass that on to your children. Okay, so I want you to think about that as I'm, as I'm talking the next couple slides. So one of the examples of Lamarck's ideas would be that this bird here um, could have acquired long legs because it was in deep water looking for food. And the more that it was in the deep water, its legs grew longer in order to help him stay in the water. So structures of individual organs could also change if they weren't used. As I said earlier, if a bird stopped using its wings, the wings would become smaller. <coughs> and so any type of trait that was altered by an individual organs, we're not talking about a population, we're talking about individuals, those would be called acquired characteristics. Acquired characteristics. Now Lamarck also said so, so if this bird acquired longer legs, when he had offspring or when she had offspring, their offspring would also have long, long legs, and this would be known as inheritance of acquired characteristics. Thus, over a few generations, birds like this still w could evolve and have longer and longer legs. 
Now, if you're looking at one of the questions at the beginning of the, uh, this video was about the giraffes, if you read them, I think it was the second one. So according to Lamarck, this short-necked uh, ancestor kept stretching his neck to reach the leaves higher in the trees because the food, you know, the food source for giraffes are high up in the trees. And so he could, he could actually stretch his neck to make his neck longer. Now, whether you know that this is not true, and, you know, he's not going to stretch his neck from being that short to that long, but this is what Lamarck uh, proposed. He also proposed that animals have an inner need to become perfect. And when I say perfect, more uh, perfect in, for that environment. So we know that Lamarck's hypotheses were incorrect. One way is that animals or organisms don't have a need to become more perfect. Secondly, evolution does not mean that a species becomes better. Okay, and then this is not predetermined, so it's not determined that necessarily their neck is going to get longer and longer and longer and longer as we go. It might get to a certain length and stop and then something else. But we do know now that in evolution, um, organisms, uh, when they change over time, they're better adapted to their environment. So as the environment changes, the organisms have to change. In addition, we know that individuals uh, that have those uh, acquired traits do not pass them on to their offspring. That would be like um, you lifting weights and you get stronger and stronger muscles, you get big muscles. When you have children, does that mean your children are going to have big muscles? No, they're going to have to lift weights also in order to do that. But there were some good things from Lamarck's hypotheses. First of all, he was one of the first uh, scientists to say that species changed. He was one of the first to say that species changed. He was also one of the first to try to explain evolution using natural processes that it occurred naturally. And he also recognized that there was a link between an organism's environment and its body structures. The next scientist is Malthus, and he's a sociologist, and he talks about populations. And basically what he uh, says is that populations will continue to grow as long as there's enough space and food. When there's not enough space and food, then they start to compete. Individuals in that population will compete. Now, some things that work against a population, and we know this uh, probably from your social studies classes, war will reduce a population, F famine, you know, not enough food, and diseases can destroy a, or limit a population. Now, Darwin realized that Mathis's reasoning applied also to other organisms, not just humans. So, for example, an oak tree or any plant, they produce thousands of seeds, but that doesn't mean there's going to be thousands of plants. So if you think of an oak tree, how many seeds they have, there might be a couple trees that actually grow from those seeds. And the trees that do grow, all of them don't necessarily survive to adulthood. So when Darwin realized that most organisms don't survive and reproduce, he wondered, what is it that allows some individuals to survive? Which individuals survive and why? So we have what is called uh, selective breeding. If you remember from uh, genetics, we talked about selective breeding, and that's when the organisms are chosen that will be fertilized and reproduced. Um, I'll give you some examples here if you go ahead and read this. So selective breeding is also known as artificial selection. That's what Darwin called it. And artificial selection is when humans select the traits that they find useful and purposely uh, breed those organisms in order to get the traits that they want. And obviously during Darwin's time they didn't call them traits, but uh, the variations that they wanted. Now you have to remember this is in the 18, uh, early 1800s and um, Mendel had not published his information yet. So Darwin had no idea about big T, little t, about dominant recessive traits. He just knew that variation occurred in animals, plants, animals, and in wild animals, too. And instead of calling them mutations, he knew that there were individuals that had defects, 
which now we call mutations. And this natural variation is important. Why is, the, why is variation or diversity important in a population? Well, it's important because when the environment changes, if every organism or every individual in that population is the same, theoretically that whole population could be uh, eliminated. So if you have diversity in a population or variations in it, there's a good chance that some of them will survive and be able to reproduce. And I will stop this video here.